just a brief introduction, um, not to assume that everybody knows who I am. As it was said before, my name is Michael, and I'm here with my wife and three children. I'm originally from London, but now we live in Wolverhampton, and I've been here once before, so it's a privilege of being here again. Um, I always get stuck when I'm asked, how do we introduce you? Because um, I've got no BA and PhD, but I like to say, well, I do have a BA, born again. <laughs> I suppose that counts for something. Um, but I praise God for what he's done so far in my life. And um, I take it as a privilege. I don't think it's something I've earned to be up here, but it's a privilege for me to share God's word. And I say I'm a lay speaker because I am. I'm just a normal average member who goes to church every single week. So next week, if I'm not speaking, I'll be in a congregation like yourselves. So, um, so basically I'm trying to say nothing special. This is what's special today, the word. But I do believe God uses me in a powerful way. I am bold in that respect because if I wasn't, I wouldn't be a Christian to this day. And I think each of us must be bold in what God can do in us. Not the speaker, the pastor, but God in each of us, if we have faith in his love for us, he can use us in a powerful way. Um, yes. So before we begin, let's just have a brief word of prayer. I know we've prayed already. I know the Lord is here, but it's just as my custom that I just to make sure that God will use me. So just bow your heads with me as I just pray. Father in heaven, there's not a worthy bone in my body, but Jesus Christ is worthy. So, Father, according to your promise in Luke eleven thirteen, that if I ask for the Holy Spirit, he'll be given unto me. So speak through me, I pray, that people's hearts will be touched. It's a solemn message we're going to be studying from the word. And I pray at the end, we're not just made aware of the devil's deceptions, but also of the power of the truth of God's word and what it can do for our lives. I ask that you answer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I've never used this before, so hopefully I will be okay. Yep, there we go. Title should be coming on the screen any moment now. I've decided to entitle it Dancing with the Devil. Dancing with the Devil. As you can probably see from the screen and the title, what we're going to be discussing and what I'll be presenting today dancing with the devil we are going to be looking at music now our opening scripture that we're going to be reading is going to be on the screen but it's going to set the entire tone of our presentation it will set the premise the premise of everything that I'm going to say we're going to read this scripture and yes it will set the premise of everything I'm going to. in first Samuel 16:23. We have a scripture about music and the power of music. The power of music. It says it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the what departed from him? The evil spirit departed from Saul. What made the evil spirit, according to this passage of scripture... What made the evil spirit depart from Saul? What was it? Was it words? It was the music that David played. Before we go anywhere, brethren and visiting friends, before we go anywhere, we have to understand and accept this premise that the Bible is laying down. And we're going to see science agrees with this anyway. This is what I love about God's word. God's word is not just outside there and just says stuff. It can be backed up by archaeology, by history, by human experience, but also by science. But we're starting with the word of God. The evil spirit departed from Saul when music was played. So if we flip the principle, we flip what happened here, that means then there are certain types of music that can attract evil spirits. If we really understood this, and I'm speaking specifically to our younger people who are going to be challenged with this temptation every single day, if you understood that, what decisions would you make as to what you listen to and what you watched? 
if you believed that point. That certain music I listen to doesn't attract the holy angels, but attracts the fallen angels. They love to be around you because you've invited them. You know, like the, it's not true, but sorry to use this crude analogy, but we're familiar with the vampire myths, right? Now, the vampire can't enter your home without an invitation. He could never enter your, you had to invite him in. In the myth, he couldn't come in. You had to invite him in the house. And once he was in, he could get up to his diabolical schemes. It's funny that. Where did they steal that idea from? That has a spiritual truth to that. Satan cannot enter our minds with our, without our permission. But because he knows no one is going to say, hello devil, come on through. He has to do it by deception. And by fraud. Are we clear, brethren? Let's continue. Oh, I was using this. So in 2 Timothy 3.16, let's lay down another principle, brethren, and visiting friends. The Bible says this, all scripture, how much scripture? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? righteousness all scripture is inspired by God now follow the logic brethren follow the logic watch this that includes what book of the Bible Psalms now does anybody know what the word Psalms means correct it means songs the largest book in the Bible is a bunch of songs brethren music now it says all scripture is inspired, was given by inspiration of who? So these songs were inspired by who? God. Follow the logic, brethren. We have songs that were inspired by God. They are designed to instruct us into what? Righteousness. Let's flip the principle then. That means there are songs that can teach us, that can instruct us into what? Unrighteousness. There's light, there's darkness, there's hot, there's cold, there's big, there's small, there's fat, there's skinny. There's good, there's evil. The very psalms you're reading are songs. You can put chords to them today. You can put any melody you want. And those words, the content of those words are going to be teaching you something. So today, fathers and mothers and guardians, I'm speaking to you as well. You need to be aware that right now, and I'm saying it as a fact, if your children go to school, it's a fact, because I went to secular school, I went to public school, it's a fact they are being taught how to rebel against God every single day, and you don't even know it, by the music that they listen to. It's teaching your young men how to fornicate, and you haven't even told them yet. It has taught them how to do it. You haven't even given them a discussion about the birds and the bees yet. It's teaching your young ladies what it means to give their bodies away before it's the time. The music is teaching our children. It is instructing them into unrighteousness and not righteousness. Now, we know that, but the reason why I'm saying it, because if we knew it, then our young people would be different to this day. Ask yourself the question, why does every generation of youth leave the church? What are the factors that are involved? There are many factors, right? But one of the largest factors, I guarantee you, and I'm laying my life on the line when I say this by experience and by the word of God, it has to do with music. I didn't say it is the end and be all, brethren. I said a large factor. The world is very attractive. Is very, very, and the pool is even stronger than it was when I was a young man. I'm not even old. The pool is very, very strong. So we're dealing with not the beats and the rhythms today. I'm not discussing that. We're dealing with the teachings and the messages of the music that we are confronted with. Are we clear? So as we're going through, do not interpret my words and say, is he talking about hip-hop beats, reggae beats, R&B? I'm not talking about that. Because a beat on its own, and here's my logic, you may not agree, but a beat on its own can only do one thing. It doesn't teach you anything. It can only make, it can only make you feel something. Do we agree with that logic? 
It can only make you feel. That's what it's going to make you do. Right? It's just going to make you dance. That's it. But put words behind that power. Now it's going to affect my thinking and my worldview. Because now it's teaching me. So now you have a weapon at your disposal. Because now as I'm, I'm now learning something. Either for good or for bad. Either to motivate me or to inspire me or what have you. Are we clear, brethren, and visiting friends? So I'm not talking about rhythms today. I'm going to be talking about the content and the messages. First Peter 5 verse 8. We are warned, brethren, and we are, yes, we are warned. It says here, be sober, be vigilant, because your friend, the devil, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Peter uses an object lesson, friends, in nature to tell us how the devil works. He points to which animal in the animal kingdom? The lion. And it's usually the female, in fact, it's not usually, the female hunts the most. Unfortunately, the male lion fits the stereotype in the human kingdom too. He's lazy. He only hunts when he has to. When he's starving, he will hunt. But the lions usually hunt. Now, why would Peter use a lion? Does anybody know which animals do the female lions attack? When I say which, what, what type of animals do they attack in terms of their condition? The weak. They attack the youngest, the slowest, the weak, and the injured. You watch any good David Attenborough show, any nature show, you'd see them. They would attack everyone. And everyone scatters. And the only reason why they make everyone scatter, all the animals scatter, so is to see who is weak and who is slow. So as all the wildebeest, for example, scatter, they observe. And they see one young one leaving his mother's side. Or one that's injured from a previous attack. That's the one we're going to go after. Peter is using this object lesson for a reason. Satan is our adversary. He attacks us when we are weak. Weak spiritually could be certain things like maybe I'm not praying as much. Maybe I'm not studying. Or maybe I've got a death in the family and I'm depressed. Maybe I've had an argument at work. All of these things can set us off to being weak when now we're not vigilant and understanding the, the pitfalls the devils, have, the devils have for us. Brethren, young people, Satan is not your friend. You should be waking up every morning, young people, understanding, not being scared of the devil, but understanding that because you have chosen Christ, the devil is your adversary. More so. More so. Even if you haven't chosen Christ today, the devil is your adversary. Because by virtue of the fact that Christ died for your sins, Satan hates you. Because you're entitled to something which you haven't done anything to contribute to, and he's jealous of that fact. In fact, Satan's wrath is kindled against the human race because you are the object of God's supreme love. Let me say that again. Satan's wrath is kindled against you because we are the supreme object of God's love. Not because we accept Christ. We get it worse when we accept Christ because now we are ambassadors to tell others about the enemy and what they're entitled to. But before you even accept, this is what I love about God. You don't need to accept God for him to love you. No, 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 no. He loves you already. We forget that. I have to earn my way to God. That does, that, find me a text in the Bible that says that. For God so loved the world. Before you decide, before you change, before you commit, before you surrender, you already have all of God's favor in your life. Let's continue. I'm going to get used to this. 2 Timothy 2.26. This is why I get the inspiration to cover this topic today. It says that they may recover themselves out of what, brethren and visiting friends? The snare. The snare of who? The devil, here we're seeing again, the Bible is telling us how the devil works. The snare of the devil who are taken, what? Captive by him at his will. Satan uses traps. He sets traps for you and I every single day. He doesn't just come in his, in his, in his you know, as he is. 
he sets traps. He disguises himself by setting snares. What are those snares? If you don't know what they are, it's a guaranteed realization that maybe you're in one of those traps. Don't you know what his snares are? What are his snares? And this is why, brethren, I'm covering this because, as we're going to see, what is the snare of the devil? What does the Bible say the snare of the devil is? And after this slide, we're going to go into the meat and the potatoes of this presentation. So let's ask the question because we want to see what the Bible says, not our interpretation. What is the snare of the devil. So I typed in the word snare in my Bible software and I see what other passages are there in the scriptures to help me understand is there something specific that the devil uses? Well, let's look in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 31. And I'm reading from the RSV. I usually read from the King James Version, but this one makes it just a little bit more simple to understand without the these and the thou's. And it says this listen carefully. When the Lord your God shall cut off the nations from before you, where you go to possess them and you dispose, so and you dispose them and dwell in their land. Take heed to yourself so that you, not, you are not what? Ensnared by following them after they have been destroyed before you and that you not inquire after their gods. Listen carefully. You not inquire after their gods saying, how did these nations do what? Notice how. Not Shall we serve their gods? How did they worship their gods? Even so will I what? Remember he says, don't be ensnared by following them. In what way was God saying to ancient Israel of old? Look, be careful not to follow those, those nations. How? Don't be tempted to ask this question. When they would see the worship of these nations, worshiping their false gods, he said, look, don't be tempted to ask this. How did they serve their false gods? How, how did they worship? Verse 31. You shall not do so to the Lord your God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to what? In simple language. In our, in our lack of knowledge, we might assume that the way other nations worship their gods, even to this day, who are not Christian, all they do is bow down to idols. And that's it. Offer some incense, and that's it. No. When you do further research, then and even now, it's exactly the same. Because the religions who existed then still exist to this day. What did they use? What did they use to worship their false gods with? You shall not do so to the Lord your God for every... To the law which he hates, they have done to their. So in their worship, they took things that God detested, that God hated, and they used that for worship. So there were things God utterly detested, didn't like, you shouldn't do that. They took that and used that for worship. And that was worship to their God. Let's make this practical. So as we research, what were some of the gods of the ancient world? And what did they use to worship those gods? Because we're reading the scriptures. And if the scriptures is true, let's research what the scriptures has says historically. Well, here's an example. A false god, a pagan god. Obviously, these gods don't exist. In fact, what does Paul call the gods of the Gentiles that they used to worship? He does, he's not PC, Paul. What does he say? Does anybody know? He says the things that the Gentiles sacrifice to, they sacrifice unto devils. So these gods, young people, don't actually exist, but these were the gods that people worship. Dionysius or Bacchus, god of wine and what? Mystical ecstasy. In Roman legend, Bacchus stepped in for Dionysius and earned the title of what? Earned the title of what, brethren? In fact, a drunken orgy, we should all be familiar with what that word means, a drunken orgy is still called today a Bacchanalia, and for good reason. Devotees of Bacchus whipped themselves into a frenzy of intoxication, and in the spring, Roman women attended secret ceremonies in his name. Bacchus was associated with fertility, wine, grapes, as well as sexual free for alls. What if you took away the idol, but the lifestyle 
remained. Bro, don't miss this. If you miss this, my whole presentation is not going to make no sense. You're going to say that's Michael's opinion. No, no, no. We read in Deuteronomy, God says, when I wipe out these nations, don't go and inquire how did they serve their gods. Because he says they took abominable things and used it in worship. So what did they do to worship Bacchus? Bacchus gave license to a sinful lifestyle. All Bacchus was and every ancient deity, and research this for yourself, every deity was, and listen now, was a deification of sin. Did you hear the words that I use? It was just a deification of sin. So you wanted to drink your alcohol? Bacchus was your guy. Because the Hebrew God says, no alcohol. Oh, I don't really like that. Man has never changed. The only difference is today we think atheism actually exists. Oh, I'm an atheist because I don't worship. I'm not religious. But you get drunk on the weekends, fornicate up the place, and think you're not worshiping no one. This is why people hate the word of God because its standard is so high and it's not in harmony with our natural desires. But the Bible doesn't stop there. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is, yes, you are a sinner. We are sinners, but Christ came to save us from these things. So if you took away the idol, but the lifestyle remains young people, what do you have? You still have worship. Doesn't matter what you want to call it. You can call it a party. You can call it a good time. You can call it cohabitation. It is worship. Because your members were designed to give glory to God. So how is Satan going to get us young people to want to have the lifestyle that Dionysius promoted? How is he going to convince us that doing these things makes sense? How? I did say we're going to go to scientific evidence. And here's the science behind the influence of music. Here's the science behind 1 Samuel 16, 23. Psychology Today, December 1985, page 54. Musical rhythms affect both our hearts and our Brains, one road to arousing a range of agitated feelings, tense, excited, sometimes sexual, is through pronounced and what? Insistent rhythms. It continues to say, artfully used to heighten the sexual tension, drumming may produce these powerful effects by actually driving the what? Our neural pathways can actually be affected by the music that we listen to. Scientific evidence. So here's a message that many of our young people would have heard and are faced with. Here's a song called Trap Queen 2015 by a, a, a guy whose name, or his stage name is Fetty Watt, but his real name is William Maxwell II. And I get high with my baby, I just left them all. Is he talking about ascending the, the peaks of the Himalayas? When he's talking about getting high? Can someone tell him, what's he talking about? He's talking about drugs. I'm getting fly with my baby. Yeah, I can ride with my baby. I'll be in the kitchen cooking pies. Is he talking about the shepherd's pie? Mince pie? What's he talking about? Is he talking about I, I'm, uh, you know, applying for the master chef? What's he talking about cooking pies? Can someone tell me? He's talking about the way in which they prepare heroin to sell on the streets, cooking pies. Now, our young people in England, and especially our church goody two-shoes church kids who don't know about the street life and the slang, sing these songs. How I know? Because I had two young people tell me this is one of the songs that they sang. And it came up by accident in a conversation at my home. We just were just normally talking, and I don't know how music came up, but it came up and I said, do you know what those words mean? They're like, they don't mean nothing bad. I said, okay, let's go to Google. And I Googled the, um, what was it now? Um, it's a dictionary, street slang dictionary. All right? I Googled their words of the song, put it in the street slang dictionary, and I says, cooking pies. The dictionary tells you what it means. They were shocked. Couldn't believe it. And because they're still young, it still had an impression upon their minds. 13, 12, they were abhorred that they were singing a song that was glorifying something, which is not just illegal in the eyes of God, but it's illegal in the eyes of the state. Not just in the eyes of God. You wonder why, how many young people from Adventist homes end up in prison. How does that happen? Why are they so attracted to the gang's lifestyle like it's good when you only survive probably into your early 20s, if that? 
You don't live in London. But in London, you have an epidemic called post Cold Wars. When I was young, it didn't even exist. That didn't even make any sense. You had area gangs. So in Brixton, you had Brixton boys. In um, Streatham, you had Streatham boys. In, in um, Younger 28s in, and then Peckham boys. The whole area had a gang. Now you have gangs within areas. Literally, from one post go to another, you have two warring gangs. And guess what the, be the beef, guess what the, uh, the, the confrontation is all about? You're on a different postcode. You're in a different postcode. I see a brother say drug. It's not even drugs, my brother. It's postcode. That's why it's called postcode wars. You can go from one area to, which area are you from? Peckham. You're in Brixton? We stabbed you up right there on the spot. There are YouTube videos in the hundreds where you see 10 guys attacking one guy with a knife. And it goes on every single day. It's an epidemic. How has that happened overnight? In the space of 10 years, or how many years since I left school? Maybe 15 years? In the space of 15 years, this has just, it didn't exist when I was a boy. All of a sudden, it's there. What factors, what social factors have developed to cause such a frenzy in this area? Gun crime and knife crime, and it's going up and up and up. Do you think maybe it's the music that they're listening to? If you're putting in your mind teachings that glorify that lifestyle, how on earth are you not going to do it? Now, I know young people, you're sitting here saying, don't affect me. Well, let me challenge you on this one. Would you listen to music that said you should kill every black person because of the color of their skin? Every Filipino is a stinking boop. Would you listen to that music? No, you wouldn't. So why do we listen to music that denigrates and is speaking to us more of the, of the darker tone in this audience, if you know what I mean? That cool black women, B-I-T-C-H. Any race underneath the sun wouldn't do much nonsense like that. But why does black people sponsor, support music that puts down our own race? Millions. It's not funny. We're here in a community where we're trying to uphold principles of marriage, right? But then you're listening to music that says marriage is for dorks. You're listening to me, you're watching hip-hop videos and R&B videos, which is telling you, don't get married. Sleep with the girl before you get married. And you think you're not going to want to do that? Of course you will. Because we, when we see it and when we feel it, it looks good, it sounds good, it tastes good as well. But it leaves you with a bitter taste in your mind. And this is the problem with young people. Because you have no sexual experience and you're seeing certain things, you don't believe what your parents is telling you. Even when I'm saying you don't believe it. We don't believe it. You, know, you don't know what you're talking about. It's not, it's not going to harm me. It's not going to harm me. He likes me. He promised me this. He promised me that. Ask your, any single mothers in this place, ask them how it feels to be on their own right now. And tell me if, it was, if that's funny. Ask them how it feels when they were promised by the guy and the woman always gets the bad rap but the man's able to leave and do his business. But the woman has to carry, quote unquote, the burden. Single mother, got kids now, where's the man? And this goes on and on and on. Young people come to church and they're not interested in what we have to say because they've been with the devil, they've been dancing with the devil all week. And we expect 30 minute sermon to undo a whole week with the devil. I've been dancing with the devil and I like his music. I want to be with the devil. I want to be, but this is the deception. We don't think it's the devil. Because we think the devil's going to come to us like the evil demons in Harry Potter. That's how we think the devil is. Ugly and yeah, nasty. We don't understand the principles. We don't understand the warfare, what evil is, pride and all these things. We like the devil to come the way because it makes us feel good. Is there where I can jump slides? Let me just... I think I've made my point here. I couldn't even bring you lyrics from this young lady, unfortunately, by the name of Nicki Minaj. Her real name is Onika Tanya Mirage because it's so disgusting and vile. And I consider myself quite a liberal person, to be honest. If you see how I discipline my children, I don't smack them and, you know, I, the things I allow them to watch. I think I'm pretty liberal. I'm a young guy. And this individual, unfortunately, I couldn't put slides on the screen because it's disgusting. 
She doesn't use euphemisms. She doesn't use things you have to think, oh, what does that mean? She's very plain and explicit in what she's talking about, the sexual experiences. She mentions body parts in her songs. And these things young people, young girls, young boys are listening to. Don't even bother watch her videos. If you're watching her videos and you don't feel nothing, you're very far away from God. Because I'm trying to, I couldn't find a decent photo of this girl. It's, it's almost porn. It might as well be porn. Because how she dresses is so indecent, it's ridiculous. And I'm saying this because she's one of the most famous. When you go to the shops, why are shops selling mini skirts for my eight-year-old daughter? Why? Bikinis that only cover the nipples for eight-year-olds. What's that all about? Brethren, we are being bombarded left, right, and center. I'm going to cover two more slides and then I'm going to close because of time. Here's an article, Saturday the 2nd, June 2012, The Independent. Degrading lyrics linked to earlier teenage sex studies says, those who listen to explicit songs more likely to be what, brethren and visiting friends? Sexually active. It says, reachers say they have found a strong link between early sexual experiences and what? Popular songs. It goes on to say, there does seem to be a what kind of association? Strong, not weak, strong association between sexual experience and music with degrading lyrics. I'm going to cover, can I, how do I jump slides? Can you come and help me? Because it's 127, I don't want to keep you here any longer. I want to cover just a few more, but one individual that's really going to blow your mind away here. All oh, right, okay. Oh, it doesn't show me which one. Let me see. Oh, it, it's loading. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Right, here we go. This guy here. I'm glad that caused a reaction. As you can see on the screen, I've got the hip-hop and occult connection. As my title is Dancing With Who? Dancing with the devil. Let me show you this. And there's a reason. It's all intentional. I'm using science. I'm using newspaper articles. It's all intentional. Published 21st of April 2013. Forget Scientology. Celebs are now falling for an even more sinister what? Quote unquote religion. Introducing the satanic what brethren? Sex cult, that snaring, hmm, interesting, where did we read that word? In the Bible. Snaring stars such as who? Peaches Geldof. Unfortunately, she passed away. Founder Alistair Crowley dubbed the wickedest man in the world. Other stars linked to the cult include Jimmy Page and who else at the bottom? Linked to this. Look what the Daily Mail is calling this religion. Satanic sex cult. Not my words. Let's read another article. Taking that face value, it was an innocent enough remark. Just speaking about she was, um, Peaches Geldof was promoting this religion. We we're going to see in a second. It says, encouraging friends to exploit belief system to apply to day-to-day -day life to attain peacefulness. But when Peaches Geldof chose to share her religious convictions with her 148,000 followers on Twitter, it lifted the lid on a much more what? Sin Listen to the words this report is using. Sinister world than first impressions would what? Suggest the socialite 24 is a devotee of what? Ordo Templi Orentis, or known as the O2O, even has the initials tattooed on her left arm. And this is uh, the Twitter, sorry, Instagram photo of Alistair Crowley's books. Now, brethren, do not even bother go and try and read any of this nonsense. I haven't. I've read what people have said about it. People, and not people who are against it, people who follow it. And it promotes things like child sacrifice and the most wickedest, darkest things you should never even know someone is capable of. Because he was dubbed by the press of his day when he died, the wickedest man alive. He was a Satanist, but the, he was so, okay, let me give you a picture. He was so bad, he set up O2O because the secret society was in, he was too wicked for them. They kicked him out. 
Because the things that he was doing, that he was experimenting with, took it to another level. They're like, you're too wicked. So he set up his own one. And she was promoting this. And that's why the reporter even is appalled, them, appalled themselves. This was said, but a closer look at O2O and Alistair Crowley, its founding prophet, gives the lie to that assumption. Crowley, who was born into an upper caste British family in 1875, styled himself as the great B666. Revelations 13, the last verse, verse 18. He was an unabashed, what? A cult. That means unashamed, proud about it who prior to his death in 1947, reveled in his infamy. He was proud as the wickedest man in the world. His form of worship, did you hear that word? His form of worship. Now, who, who did the press say is in this satanic sex cult? Jay-Z. That's why on his cover, it says, do what thou wilt. Because that's a famous saying promoted by rock stars, many stars down from the 50s all the way down. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Is a famous maxim coined by Alistair Crowley. That's why he was proudly wearing it as a hoodie. In that, his form of worship involved sadomasochistic. Look at that word. Sadomasochistic set rituals with men and women. Spells which he claimed could raise malevolent gods and the use of hard drugs including opium, cocaine, heroin and masculine. Do these things work? These things kill our society. And our music promotes these things. It's no joke. Have you ever worked with everyone on heroin? Have, has any, this is the thing, because we're such in our cocoon as church folk, we have no just, this is why we must do the work. Because you don't have to do drugs to understand what it is. I've never done drugs, but I've worked with people to understand the dangers of it. That's why we must have to witness and get out of our cocoon so we can understand what sin is doing to people. Because when you just read it on these beautiful pages, when you sing about it, and when God warns us, we sit there and think, is it that serious? Michael, why are you so serious? Because we live in serious times and the devil's not mucking around. I don't know what, I hope none of you are played with some of these situations. I just hope and pray that you are, your children are not for, um, um, going through any of these things. Of course we sin, we make mistakes, but there are degrees. There are degrees that Satan wants to drag you down. You think he just wants you to drink alcohol. No, he moves you from alcohol to weed, to weed to harder drugs. There's always a development. And anyone here who's struggled with those things knows what I'm talking about. That's how it starts. You go harder and harder and harder and harder because your heart is never satisfied. In his song called Lucifer, he named the song called Lucifer. Lord, forgive him. He got them dark forces in him, but he also got a righteous cause for sinning. Praising Lucifer, glorifying that Lucifer had a righteous cause for sinning. Come on, brethren. The devil. Could he get away with that in the 50s and the 60s and 70s? No, he couldn't. That's how far this world is going. That you can sing about Lucifer and no one bats an eyelid and I'm the crazy one. We're living in, we're in a Methodist church. This country, its background is Protestant, Christian. The most of the people who went to World War I and II were Christian. When rock and roll came out, people were pulling out their hair. Oh, this is the devil's music. That was soft compared to this. They wouldn't allow Elvis Presley to wiggle his hips on TV. They filmed him from the head to the stomach because they thought that was too explicit. Could you imagine that generation living now? Who is this on the screen? This is a famous band, Beatles. And it's the front cover of a famous album, Sergeant Paper and the Lonely Club's Heart Band. And on here, they put on the front cover people that each of them respected and adored. Now, there's someone in the background that I want you to notice. Does anybody know who this man is? Alistair Crowley. Why on earth is he on there? Brethren, but it gets even worse. Can it get worse than Alistair Crowley? I think it does. Well, not even I think. 
Who is this? Does anybody know who this cardboard cutout is? Can you see that? It's not too clear, is it? Well, let's let the newspapers or let's let the person who put together this scene tell you who that is. And then we're going to close. Where's Adolf? Don't miss this, brethren. Where's Adolf? The mystery of Sergeant Pepper is solved. Lennon's choice for album sleeve led to one of the rock's greatest cover-ups. The scene has become one of the world's most imitated, iconic, and widely owned artworks since its creation 40 years ago next month. The cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album has sparked debate about the cultural heroes who were picked or excluded for the final cut. It goes on to say, for generations, it has been accepted that John Lennon's wish to place Jesus Christ and who? I'm going to let that just sink in. I'm going to let that just, cultural heroes, Jesus Christ, that kind of makes sense. Mahatma Gandhi, that kind of makes sense. Alistair Crowley, that doesn't make sense. Bad of Hitler? Alistair Crowley was wicked according to our standards, but he didn't kill six million people physically. Cultural heroes. These are not my words. But now the artist who created it, Sir Peter Blake, has revealed for the first time that Hitler did make the final lineup for the sleeve, but was simply obscured by the Fab Four. Sir Peter told the Independent on Sunday, yes, he is on there, you just can't see him. Cultural heroes, it said. Now, it's going to take another presentation as to what the link is, as to why they even put Adolf Hitler on their front cover and the likes of Aleister Crowley. What were they actually really into? And if you have no clue, that's why you're going to be confused. But the art of a good storyteller is leave you wanting more. Or you can research that for yourself. What is my point, brethren? Dancing with the devil. How? Not willingly, but foolishly and ignorantly. Deceived. Not understanding what God has for us. Not understanding that God's way is better than the devil's highway. Yes, it's a nice feeling. Yes, the beats sound good. There's nothing wrong. But what is the message behind those rhythms? What is it teaching you? What is it getting you to believe? You wonder why young women feel they need to dress a certain way. You wonder why young men feel they have to go a certain way. Where are we learning it from? And I'm saying this because I've been there. I've done it. I'm not old. I still feel I'm a bit hit, but man, not anymore. My, the music I used to listen to wasn't good, but boy, it's nothing compared to this. And that's why I fear for our young people. And I'm trying to raise the trumpet loud and clear and say to our young people, it is not easy. It's not easy at all. But if you're wondering why you're losing in interest, why you're inconsistent in your Christian walk, just maybe there's a snare that you're trapped in. Just maybe there's things you're entertaining. And it's not easy, brethren, because they're going to go to school. And how do you think they're going to face up to their friends and say, I don't want to listen to that. What do you think the reception they're going to receive? Some might say, why? But most might laugh. You think that's easy? That's not easy. That's not easy. And my appeal is simply that if, we're, if we've been listening to anything that we know, that we look at God's word and say, that's not promoting Christ. That's not promoting his righteousness. Yes, we like it. Yes, we succumb to it. But Jesus says, I come to deliver the captives. The Bible says there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. John 3, 17, for God sent not Christ into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I pray as we stand that we will commit and ask Christ for those of us who are subject to these things, for those of us who are tempted with these things, I, I'm hoping that at least one young person will say, you know what, Mike, what you said makes sense. I want God to help me. And if that's your call, if that's your feeling, if that's, your, that's what you want, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we close in prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand. This is not an easy message to share. 
Because when we have to highlight the things that we're in love with, doesn't matter what you're in love with, because you're in love with it, you don't want to let it go. It's love. Love doesn't let things go. And this is why we need a love more powerful, which is the love of God, to supplant or take the place for our love for the world. Does that make sense? And that's a free gift God is willing to give us. Not by works. Yes, we have to put our effort. And your effort is your will, your choice. And I pray that especially us young people who are tempted and succumbing to some of these things will ask Christ today to help them and give them strength. Because these things do not lead down a very good road. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this church. I always see their keenness to want to hear your word. But Father in heaven, as much as we are keen, as much as we do believe in you, there may be visitors among us who haven't made that choice. But especially us young people who are growing up in homes, who have been told about your name, who have been told about your ways, who have been told about your salvation, your love. The devil is on our track. We read from the scriptures, he has set snares. The snares of how the false god and how they worship was attractive back then in ancient times. It's just attractive now. The lifestyles and the things it promotes is in harmony with our natural desires. And this is why, as in our lesson study, Father, you gave us a lesson about the Spirit of God. I pray that someone here will leave, even though even now will ask for help from Christ to replace their love for the world, a love for these things with a love for righteousness. I pray that their heart wants it. I pray that they don't desire no more the things of this world because it is sin. But more so than that, it doesn't bring peace. More so than that, it literally leaves us bankrupt. We may feel nice feelings. We may hear nice rhythms. We may think it's cool. But at the end of the day, we're not happy. When, when we are abused, when lungy ladies are abused by men because they're going after the wrong men, because they're, they're duped, when young men abusing young females, thinking it's cool, they too are not happy. And I pray, Father, that you will have shown them today, and all of us older ones, we may not be subject to some of these things, but what other snares are in our lives? I pray the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds to say, Lord, give us the power right now to break free. Give us the strength. And even those who make a decision, we might fall back. They might fall back because they're in an environment that has, is very, very difficult to be a Christian. They're in an environment where they're tested every single day. So even if they make mistakes afterwards, please, as long as they make that choice, they're on the trajectory, they're on the path to want to give it up, I know one day it will be gone from their lives as it has been with myself. And I know that's only to glory to you. So Father in heaven, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. And be with us for the rest of this day, wherever we may go. Protect us from harm and danger. Forgive us of any sins that we've done. Cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And please help us to leave with that assurance in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.